Hello everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Five Areas to Optimize Your PS Workflow to Ensure Profitability, brought to you by Technology Services Industry Association and sponsored by Replicon. My name is Ingen Triago, your moderator for today. Before we get started, we just have a few housekeeping items. To maximize your webinar experience, click the question icon in the upper right corner of the registration to check your systems for the most recent versions of browsers and Flash Player. Update to the most recent version available for the optimal viewing experience. Audio will be delivered via streaming. You will be in listen-only mode and you need to listen via your computer or mobile device. Please check that your computer speakers are turned on. Webinar controls including volume are found below the presenter headshot area. To view your webinar, select your link to proceed to the player. If you're already registered, you can access by entering your email only at the top of the registration form and you can join the webinar from any device. Ask questions at any time by sending in your questions via the Ask a Question box on the left side of the webinar player. Feel free to enlarge your slides to full screen at any time via the full screen button which will appear on the top right area of the slide area. There will be an exit survey at the end, at the end of today's live webinar. Please provide your feedback on the content and experience by filling out the brief survey. And finally, a link to the recorded version of today's live webinar and access to download the PDF of the presentation will be sent out within the next 24 hours via email. Once again, thank you for taking the time to join us today. I would now like to introduce our presenters today, John Ragsdale, VP Research Technology and Social for TSIA, and Vinita Venkatesh, VP Product Marketing for Replicon. We do have a lot of exciting content to cover in the next 30 minutes, so let's jump right in and get started. John, the floor is yours. Thank you, Inga. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. According to my 2017 Global Technology Survey, two-thirds of professional services organizations have some sort of technology to automate uh, PS already in place. But interestingly, 70% of our members have planned spending in 2017 or 2018 for new or additional uh, professional services automation. So why is it that Everybody's already got something, but they're all evaluating additional technology. And that's what we're talking about today. I want to explain some of the uh, industry drivers and trends that are creating some additional use cases uh, for professional services and forcing automation for PS to evolve. So there are a lot of drivers for change in PS today, and I wanted to highlight some of the ones that we mentioned in the abstract for today's webinar. And a big one is is customer expectations. You know, in the old uh, on-premise world when PSA first came about uh, a dozen or more years ago, uh, customers just uh, kind of got <laughs> what was available to them, and very often it was a, a less than perfect experience. And today, they definitely want more visibility into projects, and they want faster quoting and scheduling. And I've got some data here from our PS benchmark showing that it's it takes an average of 38 business days from the time we first identify a PS opportunity to the time we deliver a proposal. So you can imagine in a very fast-paced cloud world, 38 days simply doesn't cut it. So customers are pushing for more flexibility and a much faster turnaround time. There's also a lot of attention today on revenue leakage and profit margins, two things that really go hand in hand. And there are a lot of issues uh, and uh, opportunities for improvement here, definitely getting a handle on disca discounting, and a lot of interest in real-time project dashboards so that we know if projects are profitable uh, before we get to the very end and there's really nothing more you can do about it. Uh, another big issue that I hear about is that a lot of companies are still uh, doing everything manually as a, as a, you know, such as time tracking, project updates, uh, submitting expense reports, and that means that the data is often very old, it's not very granular and ultimately it's not very accurate. Uh, and same with the scheduling. You know, if you're trying to schedule a lot of projects using Excel, uh, ultimately you're never going to be able to balance utilization rate, rate realization, key metrics such as that. So that, those are some of the, the drivers, but there's also 
a lot of trends right now, and I wanted to highlight two of those that I'm hearing about a lot uh, from our members. And the first is the move to repeatable projects. Uh, so obviously, in an on-premise world, uh, the bulk of projects uh, a decade ago were all time and materials. And you know, let's be honest here: if the project ran a little over on time or expenses, companies didn't worry about it that much because they passed those expenses along to the customer. But in a fixed price, repeatable world, there's a lot of focus on making sure that we're doing things quickly, succinctly, and for as low cost as possible because margins are definitely under a microscope. And another thing are these microtransactions. And I heard this loud and clear from our members at our spring conference in San Diego that many companies are finding a new source of PS revenue because IT is disappearing for a lot of companies. And customers are coming to their vendors and saying, could you please help us create a custom report or add a custom field or build a new object into the data model? Things that we used to rely on IT for, but there aren't always IT resources available. So if you're going to quote a customer for maybe a two-hour project, obviously you can't take 38 days to create a quote if you're just uh, you know, looking at one of these microtransactions. Uh, ultimately, you would spend more on creating the quote than you would the revenue for uh, the project. So definitely, we've got a lot of new opportunities for automation today. And I wanted to highlight just a couple of those as a result of these drivers and trends. So I think that uh, in the past, we focused a lot in professional services automation about moving people off spreadsheets. And there hasn't been a lot of attention on creating predefined process and project workflow maps. And this is incredibly important in a repeatable uh, prefix price project because we need to make sure that we can deliver these projects very very quickly and easily, constantly refining that process uh, to make it as easy as possible to do. Uh, definitely these real-time project dashboards, so uh, supervisors, executives know exactly what's going on. If a project's in trouble, they know about it instantly, can correct it and keep it uh, back on course. Uh, mobility is a big driver today because we want not only access to information from our mobile devices when we're running from meeting to meeting, but we want our consultants to be able to file expense reports and project updates when they're sitting uh, at the lounge at the airport waiting for their flight home. Uh, and another thing is definitely customers are demanding more detailed billing statements because they don't want to just get a bill for an amount. They want a detailed analysis of what they're paying for. And that sort of information is going to help us speed up the billing process and decrease uh, the day sales outstanding. So when I first started talking about uh, automating professional services uh, back in 2006, 2007, I, I tended to discuss it in this terminology, that there were three modules about resource management, project management, and project accounting. And I think that those buckets are still fairly true. Uh, but the challenge with this approach is, uh, for one thing, again, it was about moving people off spreadsheets. And there's not a big focus here on workflow across these three areas. And another challenge that I hear about from our members is some of the products available in the marketplace came from vendors that had a lot of existing capability. And they've kind of uh, pulled them together into a platform, uh, such as borrowing some scheduling capabilities from an HR or HCM uh, application on the resource management side, pulling some uh, project management from a PPM application that was designed for IT, not external customer projects, and pulling in some billing capabilities from an ERP system. So the, even though the functionality is there, behind the scenes, you're actually implementing three separate platforms. You've got three different user interfaces. And if you customize it, you often have to do the customization in three separate systems. So the ownership uh, and maintenance costs are uh, particularly high, impacts to usability, etc. Um, so this is no longer a great way to go to market. 
And uh, what I'm beginning to see is some new approaches to the way that we're creating modules for professional services. And I've got an example here from our uh, sponsor today, Replicon. And their approach and their go-to-market strategy is to create modules that specifically speak to the pain points of PS and allow workflow and information to flow from area to area. So you've got a consistent UI, consistent workflow, but you've got the functionality that specifically speaks to these pain points about recognizing revenue and delivering these services, contract information, billing information, uh, collaboration between all of these different groups. So today we're going to hear uh, a slightly different take on automating professional services, but one that specifically speaks to these drivers and trends uh, that I've been outlining today. So with that, I'm very happy to turn things over to our guest speaker today. Vanita Venkatesh is the Vice President of Product Marketing for Replicon. Vanita, take it away. Thank you, John. Um, thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, so just setting the stage, uh, I wanted to talk today more about our approach and how we um, approach the workflow for PS organizations, um, the five areas that we find uh, professional or professional service organizations should regularly be able to address, um, kind of any time, any uh, every day, um, any time of day, uh, sort of thing, um, and that's kind of the approach that we have put in back into our, the way we have approached building our software as well. So uh, rather than talking about a software pitch, I actually want to talk about what we think is um, is valuable for professional services organizations and how they they go about um, addressing each of these five different areas. Um, so the five areas right here uh, laid out are, are around profitability at a very granular level. Um, that handoff, as we as we mentioned, the alignment between um, the different silos uh, across finance, across uh, revenue teams, across sales teams, um, overall consultant productivity. I mean, that's that's a that's one we look at quite a bit. Um, billing, of course, so billing contracts and knowing why certain things were billed, certain things weren't billed, and um, kind of that health of cash flow as well. So what's coming in, what's going out. Um, how much work are we doing that we're getting billed for versus not getting billed for, and, and where the biggest threats lie. So we'll talk through um, each of those in a little bit of detail. So starting at, um, at profitability, we wanted, to, we wanted to ask the question to, to our customers, um, do you understand your profitability at a very granular level? So what, is that, what does that granular level mean? Not that we have a profitable business at the very top line, but who is your who is your most profitable client? What is your most profitable project? Um, what are the types of projects that your teams are actually good at? Um, so who who are your best and worst clients? What are the types of clients you should be taking on um, based on you know based on both their their margin that they bring to your business um, as well as the skill set within your own um, within your own organization? And finally, what is the right price? So are you giving services away for um, a, a value lower than what you're actually providing, or um, are you taking that up at a higher level? So some, some tips around how you can um, address each of these is, is ensuring that you have metrics across all of those different pieces, um, across all of those different activities. So being able to measure and capture at every, every level of detail allows you both to have that granular insight as well as tie it up and pull it up to that higher, um, that higher uh, holistic level. But as, as John mentioned earlier, if you have them kind of in separate systems in siloed areas that, that are not shareable, that getting that bigger, bigger picture could be time consuming, could be untimely, um, in fact, and looking at it kind of backwards rather than at, um, at any point in time in real time. So once you have all of these metrics for um, for all the activities in place at, at that granular level, um, can you analyze and adjust? So can you measure at every every step and by the way, take calculated steps as to what what is your next step in that workflow? Um, and then finally taking taking the data um, and looking at the historicals to estimate kind of the future, um, both from a price time and resource perspective. So are you able to kind of plan ahead of time and as well as kind of work through that, work through that plan um, going through the workflow itself? 
the next area um, is really around that alignment piece, and I think this is very critical across um, across organizations, and we hear about this quite a bit, um, especially as a benefit that uh, an organic platform kind of allows for uh, versus siloed systems. So um, making sure that everybody's looking at the same type of type, type of data um, from the same type of perspective, everybody's going to come at it with different needs and different perspectives, but you know, finance might come and say, hey, actually, the number I have is 800K. Um, and sales might say, why are you saying 800K? Like, we booked this as a, you know, $1.2 million deal, for example. Um, so how, how good is the organization at actually managing that transition um, from start to finish through sales, through delivery, and through finance? Maybe things change at the delivery step. Um, maybe things were misinterpreted or interpreted differently um, between sales and delivery or between delivery and, and finance even. So do the organizations proactively talk to each other? Are there issues with um, what was actually sold on the front end and the expectation set um, as well as from the delivery end on the back end? Uh, do you find that you're actually writing off project work? Um, and then are you able to uh, finally trace that information um, from start to finish? So little tips on how we can better do this um, is from the very beginning, um, making sure that the proposal development is super clear, um, and going back to John's point earlier, like asking um, and detailing out, here's exactly what's going to be laid out, here's exactly what's going to be billed for, um, and especially as things move into more fixed bid type projects from time and materials, um, you're passing on less cost over to a customer, uh, over to a client. So making sure that you're completely on plan from a resource and cost perspective is super important for, for a professional service organization. Um, making sure that you have that management discipline uh, from a resource allocation and a communication standpoint, so setting those expectations up, up front um, and, and delivering through on that. Having that entire process and that entire workflow documented from the contract phase to the statement of work all the way through what gets escalated and why. Um, all too often we see you know, little escalations when there have been management changes or uh, persona, per, personnel changes on a client end and somebody new comes in to manage the project from uh, a client end, but uh, they, they have different expectations than that were set. Um, but if you have the expectations documented, you can kind of go back to that, um, go back to that, and kind of point to it. And finally, the highlighting the point around unified information. So making sure that people are looking at um, and interpreting that project and client data in the same way. So again, as I mentioned, having all of these different silos um, creates many different interpretations of data. But having um, having them uh, in the same way and in a unified system kind of helps. Um, looking at the next area um, around consultant productivity, um, absolutely having at the, at the tip of your fingers um, which consultants are overworked and which consultants are not. So how, what does your utilization look like? Not at a team level, not at a business unit level, but all the way down to even a person level. Um, so do you know the skills of your specific consultants? What are they doing? What are they um, really good at? How, how much time are they spending on um, a certain type of task versus a different type of task? Uh, is there development areas versus, um, versus areas that you know, they can actually train other folks on, for example? Um, and do you know what their, their monthly or, or daily load uh, looks like? Um, same, same sort of thing that John was speaking to earlier, having some of that information in you know, an HRIS system or a resource management system, um, you can hold information at a much deeper and more granular level, but without feeding that back into your actual process workflow um, can hinder you because you might have, again, a different set of expectations from, from reality. Um, so making sure that you have their availability uh, kind of there and present while you're planning the resources, while you're looking at, you know, here are the projects and here's the delivery timeline. Oh my God, somebody's on vacation for a week. Um, I just have to shift my, my delivery timeline by a week because of, you know, that one critical resource that I can't replace. So being able to have that in one place 
um, is super important. Um, and then are you able to assign a resource with, with confidence um, while planning and while, uh, you know, while even contracting for, for a project? Um, so, you know, oftentimes we put in our, in our contracts initially, you know, here's the basic delivery timeline. Um, that should take into account uh, an actual resource plan to some uh, degree. If you can actually look at the, the resources that are available or not available or booked or not booked at that time, um, making that process more seamless rather than an argument back and forth with the delivery team, maybe after the fact, um, can, be very, can be very helpful. And then thinking about um, you know, how, how many times were, were your projects delayed um, because you didn't have the right resource at the right time uh, for the right cost. Uh, so uh, that that can be a critical critical factor for professional services organizations. And just to note, you know, employee attrition can affect absolutely negatively the actual revenue growth of a company um, because those those resources are very critical on every project. And you can see here um, a direct correlation between employee attrition and a annual revenue growth. So as attrition goes up, your revenue growth is, is entirely linked back to that and goes down. So going on with, um, with actually your, your consultants and are they empowered? Um, and, and kind of building off of that previous point, um, are, are we tracking those skills? Are we managing them? Are we prioritizing these, these resources um, on high value projects? Um, and are we enabling our teams to, to really look at everything in a unified manner so that everybody can interpret the information, um, at least starting from the same perspective or understanding um, the perspectives of the others in their organization? And as we mentioned, consultant productivity really, really helps and pushes out from a profitability perspective. And this becomes more and more important, especially as we um, see the shift towards fixed bid um, projects as well, because we're not we're not passing any of those additional costs back to a customer. Um, so going going on to the next point around billing, um, one of the things that you know used to happen, I, I would say, is you could get a bill and you kind of just closed your eyes and paid it as a customer. Um, but with with the expectation of technology today and um, expectation against technology today, uh, I, I keep hearing over and over again, um, and we hear a ton of times from our customers, um, that they really need to provide very detailed uh, invoices back to their clients. And their clients want to know, even if it's a fixed bid project, what were the time, uh, what was the time actually spent, what was the materials actually used. Um, and interestingly, they want that breakdown even on uh, potentially fixed bid projects. Um, so being able to provide um, that detail back in a billing contract uh, is, is actually something people are being asked for quite a bit. Um, so the question is, from a, from a PS org perspective, do you actually have real-time visibility into what's being billed and what's not being billed, what's being left on the table? Um, where are you giving discounts? How many discounts are you giving? Um, and who's approved them? What's, you know, what's the, the trail behind that? Um, is it uh, just a discount up front, or are, are you actually discounting specific services um, in between? Um, and then finally, what's actually happening from a work in progress perspective? Right? So knowing exactly what's happening at what time uh, within a project, um, but across all of your different projects <laughs> is, is key to know, right? So you might find that you have a, a team of you know, 50 people that are working across 20 different projects. Um, and then there are very specific areas where every project is being held up. So what are the trends across all of those different projects? Um, what, what's, uh, what's happening? Where, where are the holdups and where can you kind of tweak and, and measure? Where are the pieces where um, you're actually running over from a, 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 a billing perspective? Um, so where are, those, where are those delays from a receivables perspective coming from? And what we can see here, another, another correlate, correlated trend, um, any time a project is kind of delayed, um, that, that delivery 
affects very directly what you can actually bill back to a client. Um, so oftentimes as, you know, your on-time delivery goes down, um, the amount of billable uh, work that you have to write off goes up. Um, so you're not able to pass that back, um, pass that that delay or uh, or anything back to back to a customer, even if it's technically a customer's fault, right? So um, it, it makes it difficult because if you don't have that that granular view and that ability to look at the details um, and kind of point back to it, then it's very hard to tweak and optimize that system and make sure that it's you know as optimal as it can be over time. Um, so what what can we do to to stay on top of this. Um, really, that, that work in progress piece is super important. Being on top of your whip and that delivery piece, um, and this, this is what we consider core to uh, our philosophy here, that, that being on top of that work and what's actually happening day to day, um, every minute, every hour, uh, and from a whip perspective, is super important. Um, and then you can see the connection from that outwards. So how does that affect your invoices? Can you reduce the, the overall invoice time, time to invoice? Um, so as soon as you complete something, can you bill for it? Um, how does, how does that, that flow work? Um, and then can you look at your, your actual budget versus what you're actually spending? So if you can you know, drill into that and from a detailed level, um, and that ties very, very directly back to that, that whip piece of it, um, not, not after the fact, but in real time as, as things are happening, uh, how can you hone in and stay ahead of the game? So that kind of leads us to to the last point here um, around around actual cash flow stability. So another thing that we we hear from our customers all the time um, is you know putting something in place has helped us actually manage our cash flows. Um, and this is not just going from a manual process to uh, an automated process, but also having everything within within a unified kind of system that's, that's starting with work at the center, um, they're able to start making cash flow more predictable because they are capturing information at a more uh, granular, granular, granular level and know exactly where um, they need to optimize and tweak in order to get that cash flow in. Um, really having all of that ground level information to build up, uh, uh, up from. Um, and then again, some of the questions we ask, we ask our customers, um, how often do you see surprises? Um, on your project that you thought were fine. Uh, but, you know, after the fact, you find out, oh, my God, there was a lot of, you know, back and forth on this one, or why isn't the customer paying? What, what is the difference in expectation? Um, so tying that information back from start to finish, from end to end, becomes super important. So here, really, and I, I alluded to it earlier, um, but what, what can you do to keep on top of that is have real-time visibility and uh, decisions that actionable insight is really the key here. Um, so having that granular data and being able to act on it uh, in real time uh, is super important. Uh, being able to manage the overheads and the margins um, and, and, and uh, really cut out those overheads uh, wherever they might be, um, again, super important. Um, using that historical information over time in order to help plan your future um, and then never stop measuring. So continuous measurement can, you know, really help. Um, and I have a customer customer story to to help uh, kind of drive that in and how how they were able to overcome that. Um, I'm going to run through the next two slides really fast because you guys can uh, come talk to us at TSW. But um, what we've done at Replicon is really think about that operational workflow at the very center and the work that's actually being done and the time that, that individuals are putting in kind of at the center rather than kind of starting at one place or the other, we're starting at the work. And that's, that's how we, we feel like we're differentiating ourselves um, in the market and where we're providing value to our customers. But I'll leave it at that and I'm not going to run through uh, our, uh, our decks because I do want to share this customer story um, of one of our customers that was able to um, kind of start measuring at a very granular level. They didn't have standardized processes um, before they started measuring, um, and were able to put in processes uh, in order to in order to actually um, up, get an apples to apples measurement across the across the board from start to finish. Um, and as they did that, they noticed small little areas where where they could start tweaking their entire workflow, 
um, and started making a tweak, improving, measuring, iterating, and optimizing. And um, we're really able to get <laughs> quite a bit of revenue growth um, after the fact because um, of that measurement angle. So I can't, I can't drive the importance of that um, more. And it's, it's got direct measurement. We might think of it as, oh, it's just a little bit of the details, but that the devil is in the details. Um, so I think that's super important. I know we have just a minute left here, so I wanted to make sure I left time for questions, and I, I ran through that. Um, but before I do, I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you to everybody here, um, and I hope to see most of you at TSW. Um, we're we're going to have a booth there, so come, come by and say hi. And um, we're also speaking, um, I think it's on the Tuesday, uh, around 3.30 p.m., so hope to see you guys there as well to hear some, some really cool customer stories. Inga, with that, I'll pass it back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Benita and John, for a very insightful and very fascinating uh, session today. You shared some really, really great, great data. Um, so we are coming to the conclusion of today's uh, live webinar. Uh, if there are any questions that came in, uh, we will be sure to follow up with you after today's live webinar. Uh, but just a couple quick reminders before we close out for today that there will be an exit survey at the end of today's live session. Uh, please take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback on the content experience by filling out that brief survey. And finally, there will be a link to the recorded version of today's live webinar and access to download the PDF of the presentation that will go out within the next 24 hours via email. I'd like to take this time to thank everyone for taking time in your busy schedules to join us on today's live webinar, Five Areas to Optimize Your PS Workflow to Ensure Profitability, brought to you by TSIA and sponsored by Replicon. My name is Inga Triago, your moderator for today. I look forward to seeing you at our next TSA webinar very soon. Have a great day, everyone.